Mike Hopkins has been fired as the University of Washington's head coach. Who's next for UW? You are Locked On Huskies, your daily podcast on the Washington Huskies. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back in to another edition of the Lockdown Huskies podcast. I'm Roman Tomashoff. That's Lars Hansen. He writes for Inside the Huskies of Fan Nation Sports Illustrated. I'm the site editor over with Huskies Wire. Thank you for making this your first watch or first listen of the day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Now, Lars. The biggest news is I, I know we waited a couple of days to do this to kind of let the dust settle, let a couple of candidates kind of get into the mix, you know, so we could do everything over the course of one show. The biggest news is yes, I have a new background. I know. I love it. It's great. Applause. Thank you. No, but Mike Hopkins has been fired as Washington's head basketball coach. And one thing that Troy Dannon said about a, uh, a week before the firing on uh, KJR with Dave Softy Mahler is that he understood that there has not been a lot of fan interest in UW basketball over the time being. And we've seen some similar comments on the show when we had a couple of basketball segments earlier on saying, I really don't want to hear about basketball until Mike Hopkins is gone. Well, that day is finally here. And after seven seasons, there were a couple of highs. There've been a lot of lows, but it seems like moving into the big 10, there is a, a very promising future ahead with everything that, that could come of this. Yeah, and I mean, because the, there's there's so much history. I mean, I think you got to give credit where credit's due here. Ethan uh, Kilbreth, I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, I believe that's how he pronounced his last name. So he had, he brought this tweet up many times where the UW was like almost like a 500 to 600 win percentage before Christmas, like 2019 or something like that. And then since then, they've been well under 500. And and for whatever reason, it just kind of seemed like that was that always seemed like the tilting point because you go back, that was the Dave Rice, Cameron Dollar assistant coaching era, right? And then you bring in Viking Joe. You almost tried to kind of recycle yeah. the same sort of plan. Like, hey, like this is the blueprint. Let me just kind of change this guy and put this guy in. And Will Carter has been there for the entire time. Ben Lee's now in his first season at Washington this past season. But there wasn't truly any evolution. There wasn't seemingly a legitimate plan in place to say, this is how we're going to win and win on a consistent basis. I mean, to quote Jed Fish, right? This is how we're going to build the program for the short and long term, right? With basketball, it's a little different because more teams are going to use the portal. One name that we'll probably kind of talk about in the next segment, but there's one there's one team that was basically coached with zero prior minutes this season that is now going to probably make the NCAA tournament and only has five losses. So it's proof yep. that in college basketball, if you get the right coach and the right system and the right situation, you don't have to have two, three, four years built in to say, hey, these are my guys. We're finally there. Because Hopkins' best years were what? When Romar's guys were in their junior right. and senior year. Now, here's the caveat to that really quick. No, no yeah, please. Because that's, that's what I wanted to expand on, yeah. Robar did not win with those guys. They weren't developing. Yeah. That was so for everyone that says, "Hey, Hop, Robar should have got one more year." The Porter brothers would have come in, okay. But look at what happened to Missouri. The Porter brother, the Porter brother went to Missouri, and nobody's saying, "Hey, Missouri is now a hotbed for basketball." And even and even still, it's like one year doesn't buy you three or four years. That's why Mike Hopkins right. was fired, right? He could have said, "Hey, I could reload and maybe you know do a little bit better next season." It's like okay, but. We just need a new face. And and Hopkins won with Romar's guys. I mean, Matisse Thibel became a legitimate NBA player. Isaiah Stewart was always going to be an NBA player, but Hopkins got Jim him. Jim McDaniels too, yeah. Exactly. And so And that's that, – sorry, no, but that, that, that's exactly where I wanted to go with this. Because when we look back on the Mike Hopkins era, which is a little bit of what we wanted to make sure we did with this, mm -hmm. it's, yeah, the, the, the Romar years, and that, that all looms really large. And there are people who will always just say, oh, well, you shouldn't have signed him to a contract extension. That was really dumb. I, I I really hate hearing that because, and this is not in defense of Hopkins because everything he did from that point on was really frustrating. Even though, you know, we went out and or he went out and in his first like true own recruiting class outside of the Romar guys went out and signed two five-star kids and got a third transfer into quad a green. It all ended up the way it did. We, we don't need to rehash that because we all know we, he finished 58 and 71 uh, in his career in, in Pac-12 play. Yeah. And after, you know, the, the season they went to the NCAA tournament in 2018-19, he's won one Pac-12 tournament game, which is insanely frustrating. So 
And like, look at look at Keon Brooks. I saw something the other day saying he might go down as one of the best players in Utah basketball history from how good he's been over his two seasons here. But no one's ever going to remember that because of just the way the team around him looked. And it's not a slight to those guys because Severe Wheeler has been really good this season. Corin Johnson has been awesome and taken a step forward. He's really come on as of late. And you just look at some of the other guys around him where Paul Mulcahy, he's been good in spurts. Moses Wood has had his, his, his moments too. And it's just, it all comes back to Mike Hopkins, which is really frustrating because there's been so much wasted talent and so much wasted potential. And as something we talked about when, you know, we were kind of, speculating this might happen a couple of weeks ago that we we talked about just the history that seattle basketball can have it's one of the reasons i wanted to wear a seattle shirt today where there's so much history involved in seattle basketball and you really want to see that continue and we acknowledge that will conroy is probably a long shot to be the head coach at best but we're going to get into a little bit more of that discussion as well but just when, when you look at everything that could have been and I, I know the point that I was originally making was talking about his contract extension. If you didn't sign him to that contract extension and say he goes somewhere else and takes another job, we were, you, you know, you'd be sitting here talking about this, like maybe it was like what Kalen DeBoer was. And if he goes somewhere else and looks like this, all right, you dodged a bullet. But with the way those first two seasons went, winning Pac-12 Coach of the Year both times, was that really a risk you were, you were going to take at that point? I don't think so. Exactly. And I think, I mean, maybe even more, and, and I know we talked about this before the show, and I'm not proud of doing this, but the actual other discussion to have with that, so much with another UW coach, Jimmy Lake, right? Where he was yeah. getting multiple DC offers. Cal offered him as the head coach. So you kind of knew he was probably going to leave or get an opportunity to leave at some point. It's like, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't, right? Because let's say Hopkins yeah. doesn't get that extension and wins another Pac 12 tournament, and then you're replacing them either way, right? You're not going to. No administrator wants to go into an extension conversation thinking, well, what if you don't work out? Well, look at what I've done. And that was to your point. What Hopkins had done recently, back-to-back Pac-12 Coach of the Year, NCAA tournament appearance, right? Things like that where, okay, this program looks like it's going up. And then it kind of plateaued and went downhill and kind of has been riding that seesaw back and forth. Exactly. And he took that 9-22 and team to the NIT the next season, which was a huge step up. So, and again, we're, we're not defending Hopkins by any means. We know he's a nice guy, yeah. but it, 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 it all kind of is a bummer that it didn't work out. But when you, when you look back on it, you just really see how much of a valley it has become after those first two seasons, which is the most disappointing part of his entire tenure where everything was so promising. And you talked about, you know, for the uh, Ethan Kilbreth tweet and just kind of the turning point. I remember, uh, covering my very first game professionally as uh, as a member of the media, going down to Washington's game against Oregon in early 2020. And when the Huskies were up by 18 points to Oregon, Peyton Pritchard comes out and, you know, they, they chip away at the lead in the second half uh, over time, the, the whole buzzer beater, this is my city thing, like that all, that all happened. That really was one of the biggest turning points because from that point on, they could never get right. That team that, you know, I and I was a big proponent of this back in my my early blogging days, saying this team could go make a real run at the Elite Eight at the Final Four. And they finished last in Pac-12 play that season. It was it was embarrassing. It really was. But in, in a sense, when you think of the whole picture, it was kind of symbolic because to your point, they get out early to an 18, 20 point lead. Yeah. Early first two years, you're winning 20 plus games, Pac-12 coach of the year. And then the second half comes and you're like, oh, wait, now they're starting to chip away. Starting to, and that's what I want to get back to the whole point. Mike Hopkins never evolved. He was yeah. with Jim Beheim for so long at Syracuse with what, two decades almost at Syracuse, right? Mm-hmm. Working with USA basketball. So it wasn't like he didn't have the opportunities and people around him to, hey, Mike, you know, maybe try this. Hey, try, try this. You don't have to listen to all of it, but find some way to evolve. And it just it, mm-hmm. it seemed like same song, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, first. And that's, and that's what we finally saw this year with moving away from the two, three zone and it hasn't worked out, but it took too long for him to even try that, to even make that, that attempt. And you know, with that being said, let's get into some of the guys who, who, who might be in line to take the job. 
right after a message from our friends over at Fire TV, because Fire TV is your destination for sports. From live games to highlights to in-depth analysis, Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes as well as free and live TV. Whether it's opening weekend for baseball or the college basketball tournament, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands, all for free. And hey, that includes all of us at Live. Locked on and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels lets you dive into all the game analysis highlights and more to keep up to date on all the latest in the world of sports, March Madness, NBA, MLB, and lots more. Not to mention great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, and cooking videos as well. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you should. Trust me on this. To learn more, visit Amazon.com slash locked on Fire TV. And, you know, as, as long as we're, we're on the subject and, and I'm wearing a Mariner shirt, but I won't be in a couple of weeks after I buy some game time tickets to go watch the Red Sox on opening day, take on the Mariners here in Seattle, because you shouldn't have to worry about when you're buying tickets to your next big event. Just like me, I'm, I'm definitely going to buy my tickets in the last minute. I'm going to wait as long as I possibly can to take advantage of some of the killer last minute deals, all in prices and views from receipt and their best price guarantee because game time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. Like I said, the last minute tickets, the flash deals, the zone deals, there are all kinds of deals on the game time app. And the lowest price guarantee, they got event cancellation protection, job loss protection, all kinds of protections to make sure you're getting the best deal because Game Time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. All in prices show your total upfront so you know you're getting a great deal before you check out. And you can buy tickets in seconds with just two tabs. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets to Game Time, download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. So Lars, you, you, you alluded to, to the gentleman a little bit earlier, but let's, let's talk about Danny Sprinkle because a fantastic name and B definitely seems to be one of the top candidates, if not the number one candidate to take over as Washington's next basketball coach. And he really does have an impressive resume from what he's done with Utah state this season. He does, but it's almost like the best candidate, but the biggest caveat, right? Because one, it might take a little bit of time because they, again, I don't know if they're guaranteed in the NCAA tournament, but I would be surprised if a 27, 28 and five team doesn't make the tournament somehow could be wrong. But again, either way, you're probably thinking a couple of weeks till after their season is done to make that announcement. You could, you're, you're probably having the discussion already. They've already clearly been having dialogue on some level with his representatives. But then the other thing is what I mentioned in a tweet a couple of weeks ago, where Danny Sprinkle's a great hire, but does you don't want to buy out Hop for three point one and then buy out Sprinkle for about three point three, three point five? And and that's one thing where you know it's something, it's something we talked we talked about a couple of weeks ago where yeah. having some of the extra money from the Kalen DeBoer buyout could come yeah. into play here, and you, you still come out in the green in terms of that. But I, I think that's something that could fall into play here. But let's think about it from a couple of other perspectives as well. When you know we talked about the Big Ten, where you know we, we talked about the, the cheap hire in Will Conroy a, a couple of weeks ago and how that could turn out, but moving into the Big Ten. You, you have an opportunity to really make a name for yourself as a basketball school too, which is something we know this program can do when it's at its best. So why not go big? And we saw Troy Dannon go big with his football hire and go get Jed Fish. They're like, obviously there were, there were backup candidates in mind, but he was swung for the fences and he hit a home run. He's done a great job with that so far. There's, there's no reason to expect that he can't do that again. Exactly. And I think that's the thing is, especially to your point, having all the resources at Washington. And again, it, it's, is basketball worth the investment? Clearly, if you're firing the coach, because Hoffman's going to stay for one more year and just wrote sure. out the contract of Dan, Troy Dan and truly didn't care. Right. But I think we both know Troy Dan enough to know that he's not just going to let this program sit around and be a deadbeat program. Right. So if you're clearly wanting to not be a deadbeat program, you're willing to invest. Now, how much are you yeah. willing to invest? But to your point, that's the caveat with the Caleb DeVore the departure is that's 12 extra million now, I believe, what, five to seven million that they still have with Jed's buyout? Something and like that, yeah. But, but you're still in that three to seven million dollar range. Let's just call yeah. it what it is. And so with that being said, this is now the perfect time to make this hire, right? The perfect time to go all in. You don't have to get, you know, Rick Patino, a big, you know, the legendary name, right? Just go get a guy that's clearly 
taking a program who does have NCAA tournament history at Utah State, right? They, they've made the tournament in 2020, 21, 23. So they've made the they tournament. lost to Washington in 2019. Exactly, right? Exactly. So so clearly they've been to the, it's a school that's able to recruit talent and, and a good kind of stepping stone program, no offense. But it's just kind of one of those you would think, okay, Utah State basketball, you could probably, and this is where the Big Ten comes into play. If you're Danny Sprinkle, don't you want to try and go and play a coach on a Big Ten level? Because sure. if you succeed, that three million dollar contract or four million dollar contract could double to six, yeah. seven, eight million if, if you win and can turn Washington into a perennial top twenty five winner. Which again, you got back. You mentioned, I believe, in the last segment, or maybe even at the start of this one, where there is a rich history of basketball in Seattle. The Sonics are probably coming back in the next two to three years. I'm, I'm just gonna. I, I, so I would say it's gonna be twenty twenty six. It's is when it's gonna come. Ah, back. That's that's a discussion for another show. <laughs> but 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 with that being said, but to, to 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 our point here, there's so much other. I mean, Jacob Coffee going to Virginia, right? There's plenty of oh, there's plenty of basketball talent in the state of Washington and kind of just generically on the West Coast. And then you sprinkle some portal guys in there. So it's, there's when people say, oh wow, he'd be he, uh, sprinkle would be crazy to leave Utah State. They, there's it's a better opportunity for him. It's like well it's an easier opportunity because he yep. could just stay in the mountain West and do And by the way, here's the thing about the mountain West, their TV contract is up in about a year or two. So they're going to have to figure out some homes too. Do they accept to expand and do things like that? So if you're a head coach, don't you want the most security in the big 10 for a power five program like Washington? Like to me, that's a pretty easy sell if I'm Troy Dan. I, I, I agree with you there, and that's the nice thing. But, you know, we, we, we'd be remiss if we didn't discuss a couple other guys where we had the Will Conroy conversation. We're not going to rehash that. Uh, people have been throwing Brandon Roy's name out there, which it's that's not going to happen either. But the the other the other name that, you know, is seems to be a top candidate with, we'll see what it, what it looks like, is from your alma mater, Lars, uh, Kyle Smith, where don't, don't think that's going to happen, but he's probably going to be a very hot name this off season. So I, I, I will just let you take it away on that. Oh, the Modelo man, the Modelo legend himself. I mean, I think, but that's kind of the, if I'm Troy Dannon, right. If we just put ourselves in the shoe, in his shoes for a little bit, making this higher, that's the level of coach. That's probably the bar. Yeah. A sitting head coach. that's either a mountain West, lower power five level. Ideally you should, because the other name that has been floated around, I don't believe it because I mean I know the guy pretty well. I'm not not haven't talked to him in a couple of years, but no pretty well. T.J. Altsberg at Iowa State. Getting if you, that like that's the like the, in terms of list and names, that's probably at the top. Sure, but yeah, getting sure. him out of his alma mater, out of Iowa that's, City, like that's not gonna happen. I'm just I'm yeah. just I'm just. But to, to our point, we've got to throw out some other names here. But you want to look at that. That's probably your ceiling. That that's your ceiling candidate. And Kyle Smith is your floor. If you can find now, Kyle Smith is a good floor, right? But I mean, like that's it's a, a really good floor. It's like Jed Fish, right? Where we who who's going to replace Caleb? Do you call Chris Kleiman? Do you call Lance Leopold? Or do you just go right to Jed Fish? Jed's yeah. the bar. Jed Jed's like the cutoff. Jed's this is as low as we're going, but it's still a very good upper echelon higher. I, in the I think term. that Jed was the ceiling in that case, where it's it's and it's a little bit of a different discussion where you're talking about somebody at their alma mater versus, you know, somebody in Danny Sprinkle who's from the state of Washington. Uh, yeah, obviously he's from Holman, but still somebody from the state of Washington has some ties to the university. I believe his dad's an alumni. So you, you have, you have that as, as well, excuse me, alumnus. I, I, I know, you know, grammar, we're, we're going to be good at grammar. Uh, but even Kyle Smith, somebody who's living in the state obviously understands what it's like to be here. And with you, you keep saying power five and I don't want to correct you because obviously it's still what it is, but we're, we're moving into the power four and even the, the big two, which is really what this all is. And it's considered a step up. It will be a big step up for him. So it's going to be a step up for any of these, these mid-major or lower tier coaches, which is what let's be real Washington state is now. And even what, and especially what Utah state's been. So it's a big step up for them where, when you talk about Iowa state, that's, that's really swinging for the fences, but you look at this, this is going to be a comp that I, I know will sound weird, but hear me out here. When you look at the Danny Sprinkle, just hire, it's almost like hiring Kalen DeBoer in a certain sense where who knows how it works out if it works out in the same way, but it's somebody who is proven to be a winner, proven to go into the mountain West and win at a very high level and get his team to where it needs to be. And can come in and, and do the same thing because he did that at Iowa State, or excuse me, at Utah State without 
any contributors from his team last year. That's a really impressive thing to do. Exactly. And I think it's honestly a good comp with Kalen because that's kind of what you're hoping for, right? As a coach that can take that next step up that you don't have to pay yeah. eight, nine million for, but that you don't have to pay 800,000 for, and you're kind of just rolling the dice, right? So yeah. I think exactly. that is a good, it's a good comp. And also, if you think about it, we both know Kalen wasn't Jen's first choice. Right. So it was, it was Matt it, it Campbell. All, right. Exactly. Exactly. So with that, so with that, and then David ran to throw some other coaches and yeah, yeah, before yeah. they got circled together. But the point of why we're getting at is get a good list of coaches. And then if you almost, basically getting back to Jed, right? Get one of the three, get one of those three. And it's a good hire. Get Kyle Smith. What one of those three, just one of those. I mean, if you go below that line, and you then it's a different big, discussion, sure. Like if, like if you take a proven head coach in the big sky, that's way more of a gamble than the Mountain West going up to the Pac or Big Ten. Right. With that, Lars, I, I think we we need to talk about some of some of the talent that could be on this team too. Right after a message from our friends over at LinkedIn, because when you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs is the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free, just like Troy Dan, and he's probably going to throw this job up on LinkedIn, hoping Danny Sprinkle and a couple other guys apply. That would be uh, that, that, that'd be a nice little hire for uh, for for Troy and. LinkedIn probably a great place to do that, you know, because LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. LinkedIn does all that while making the process easy and intuitive. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats and might not have the time or resources to hire. LinkedIn is constantly finding ways to help make the hiring process easier. They even just launched a feature that helps you write jobs descriptions, making the process even easier and quicker. You can post your job for free at linkedin.com slash lockdown college. That's linkedin.com slash lockdown college to post your job for free terms and conditions apply. So Lars, this is something I wrote about a little bit over on Husky's Wire, and there could be a really nice stockpile of talent for whoever does take this job. Right. We're not gonna we're not gonna just say, oh, it'll be this person, oh, it'll be that person. Because it doesn't matter when you have some of these guys to work with. And it's not saying the head coach doesn't matter, obviously it does, but we just want to focus on some of the talent that could be around. And obviously the number one piece in all of this is Corin Johnson. Yep, yeah, exactly. I mean, I think that's the one where you look at the roster, especially at the guard position, he'd be a junior next year came off the bench a lot this past season, kind of played the bench role last season too. We didn't get as many minutes. Corin certainly could use one more full season to be a full-time starter. Maybe he gets two out of them, but at least just get one, right? Just keep Corin Johnson in the fold, keep him around because again, what he means to this community, scoring Corin, all those things. And then also does it on both ends of the court. So I think when you yeah. look at the returning talent, he is without question. I mean, with respect to Wilhelm Breidenbach and with respect to a couple of the other guys, maybe that we haven't seen as much of, not sure. counting Jim Diallo, Corin is without question the most important player to retain of the roster. Like if Absolutely. you got to pick two guys, Corin's the first one you're picking. 100%. And it's something where, you know, you talk about, obviously he started the last game against Washington State and has been getting a much bigger role this season. But as the season has progressed, even just the role he's had this year has increased and increased and increased. And he's lived up to the challenge every time, drops 30 against Stanford, and has just been on a tear through the last five, six games at this point. So. He's certainly number one. And we'll get to Zoom. We'll get to Casper Chavis in a little bit. But let's look at just the rest of the, the backcourt depth. Because you can talk about Wesley Yates, who I'm sure we'll get to. But, you know, a couple of the guys that you can talk about. The, the number one for, for me is Nate Calmes, where he hasn't necessarily had to play a big role this year because you look at who's in front of him and you've got Corin Johnson, who was just in the system a little bit more. Severe Wheeler obviously comes in. Paul Mulcahy comes in. So you just haven't really had as much of a need for him. And Anthony Holland's played a role too. So you just haven't really had a huge need for, for Nate Calmes. But he's somebody who can kind of be, I, I feel like the, the best comp would be like a Keon Menafield where he was last season where, you know, he came off the bench for a while, started for a little while and was just always a really fun, consistent scorer. And I feel like that's what Nate Calmes could be with expanded minutes. Yeah, I mean, we saw it as a freshman at Lamar when he's leading yeah. the league in, in scoring. So, I mean, again, now you go much lo lower division, it's quote-unquote easier to do that. But, again, it's not always easy. You can go to a lower level and get more minutes and tr to turn out to not be a good player. So, I think I think Nate is more of a good, like, 
second back kind of backup guard where you still wanted to get more minutes next season. But like I do, that's kind of I will say that is kind of the one thing issue that I had is the one thing I do want to see moving forward with, with retaining the depth is also retaining a spread out roster where you have more than just two or three bigs, right? Where it's okay. Yeah, I mean, the Wilhelm, Wilhelm Breidenbach for me is another one where if they're kind of, another junior that's going to could be a senior has at least one more year of eligibility left. When you're building out the front court, and you do have Frank Kepner, which I guess is the enigma in the room, right? Because if you're right. if, if Frank's healthy, we've seen how much of a force he can be. So just as crucial as it is keeping Nate and Corin and some of the other guards, still having some of that backcourt to not totally rebuild. But then again, if you get the right head coach, maybe you can bring an entire new roster in. But part of me says at least. Ideally, keep Frank and Wilhelm, whether they are starters or not, to be determined. But those yeah. are two other key guys where even if they're coming off the bench or playing spotty starts or spot minutes, that they're talented enough to be able to warrant that roster spot. For sure. And then we can look at Wesley Yates, where obviously we'll we'll see how that plays out. We haven't seen him play this season due to an injury and borderline five-star prospect coming out of Texas and is really, really impressive. But ankle injury, just haven't really seen much of him this season. So what does that look like? And then really the question on top of that is whoever does come in, do you retain a Will Conroy? Do you retain a Quincy Pondexter to help keep these guys around? Because I think that's a really good idea to help make sure these guys stay in the fold. And I agree. We, we had that discussion off the air before we started the show where, okay, Usually a head coach will want to bring in his new staff. But again, we've seen Jed keep guys. We've seen Kalen keep guys. So it's, it's not impossible for coaches to stay around. And if you're going to pick two coaches, no offense to Ben Lee or to anybody, you know, YK, if he was still around or anybody else, but Will Carter has proven to be, he's the one that got Jade McDaniels. He's the one that yeah. got Zoom Diallo. He's the one that's getting all these local guys. So keeping that local bridge, I think is pretty important. And then, you added Quincy where, okay, he can work with the bigs. He's got NBA experience. We saw Keon Brooks honestly get a lot better this season. Like he yeah. grew as a stretch three. He he could have played the four, but I think really he's a better talent at the, at the three. And so I think I agree. having Quincy work with him and not forcing him to play the four or the five will be better for him long-term. And you could see a coach can come and say, hey, you know what? I'm glad you didn't force him to play the four because you guys didn't have a true four, right? So those two combined, I agree that, especially when you look at the assistant coaching bench for a co for who coaches are going to want to bring in, why would you not keep two valuable pieces? One with both with NBA experience, one with more local ties that's kind of known as the recruiter. And then the one's known as the developer. They both can develop guys, but I think keeping yeah. both of those will allow the head coach to kind of get a running start. And you can still bring in two more coaches, still bring in a director of recruiting. So it's still do things like that, that are guys coming with you from your other staff. So. Or I just think, outside hires, depending on what, what the budget might look like too. Right, and that's, well, that's the other thing, too, especially with Conroy and those guys. I would imagine if it's a lower budget, if you go for a bigger name coach or spend more on the head coach, it wouldn't be the worst thing to keep those guys because Conroy is not going to say, hey, I need, like, $5 million to be a coach, right? It's like, hey, sure. I'm willing to make, you know, like, eight, nine, one, one whatever you want to call it. Whatever it is, yeah. But, but it, that's worth it if you're getting a Jane McDaniels, if you're able to keep a Zoom Diallo because when I covered Zoom Diallo's commitment down in Tacoma back in December – I was a little perplexed. I think I mentioned this on the show where he called Will Conroy before and then didn't tell Hopkins until after the decision. So clearly that relationship with Conroy is very strong. Yeah. So if you're looking at Danny Sprinkle and thinking, okay, well, would you want to lose him to Gonzaga or Arizona? No, I want that guy in my backcourt next season. So give me whatever it takes to get him. And if all I need to do is keep one of the assistants or one and a half and Quincy can kind of just work with the bigs, why not do it? Sure. And and that's the thing with both those guys where that's going to play a really important factor. And having two guys who know the program, who've been around the program for so long, that's, that's never a bad thing to have in the room. And then really the biggest question outside of that is how are, how are you going to build a team in your first year? Because we saw Hop so heavily utilize the transfer portal. Obviously it's not going to be, you know, a whole bunch of high school guys coming in last minute like we saw Jed do where he brings his class with him to Arizona. I know we keep comparing football to basketball, but that's really the best thing we can do at this point with head coach to a, to a new head coach, a new head coach. But it's it's not necessarily going to look like that, but being able to retain a, a top guy like Zoom Diallo, retaining a Casper Chavis, who's a nice depth piece, where if you're able to do that and utilize the transfer portal, which we know the budget is there, and you know it's, it's weird to say it that way, but we know the NIL budget is there, the transfer portal, because look at, 
you know, what it would take to bring in Mulcahy, Severe Wheeler, everybody else that they did this past offseason, and they were able to do that. So if that's still available, transfer guys are still going to want to come to Washington and maybe seeing the success of, let's just say it's Danny Sprinkle from somewhere else, that would certainly be an enticing factor as well. And I think the other thing to consider with Sprinkle going out, you're going to go get the portal guys regardless, but maybe not have all five be grad transfers or all yeah. six be grad transfers where, again, because I understand it where, hey, you want to have a veteran team, but then that veteran team better win. Like right. if you're not – now, to be fair, he brought in a freshman, uh, Nate Calmes and then things like that, but you really should be like 2-2-2, two, 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 not 7-2-1. Right. Because it's just, especially when you have to start doing that every year, it's just not a sustainable model of success, which is yeah. one, probably one of the things that killed Hopkins in the end, where you have to go out and get three or four new guys each season. And it's just at a certain point, it like, obviously, you know, it's not Duke, it's not Kentucky, where you can build off of one and dones and shape a roster around that for the most part. It, this, that's never going to be what Washington is. And, you know, we, we saw that experiment. It didn't work. And we saw a whole lot of experience from Mike Hopkins. And ultimately, they just they didn't work. And with that, Lars, as always, thank you so much for being here. Thank you to all the everydayers for tuning in. We really do appreciate your support. We've got so much more fun stuff coming for you this offseason. So please make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Whether that's YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, we're there. We're everywhere. We're updating this channel with new content every single day. So please make sure you subscribe and click that bell so you get notifications every time we post a new video. And please make sure to like the video. Leave us a comment down below if you have any questions, comments, or concerns if you're audio only. Please leave us a five-star review as it all really does help the show out a lot. Thank you so much for tuning in and we will talk to you on Tuesday.